I do think that little girls probably have a fair chance of succeeding. But notice how it's all, in a sense, internalized. And notice how Marva Collins makes the history of the human race relevant to those kids. So you study the classics because they have been powerful ways of expressing your life. That the dilemmas of Ulysses and Hercules, in a sense, are your dilemmas. Or the dilemmas of, of Diana, the, the huntress, are your dilemmas. I mean, if you think about the Greek mythologies, the Roman mythologies, the, the effort to bring to bear Shakespeare, that, that it's an effort to say every person should somehow come in touch with the rich historical tradition. And yet, we have a crisis in our culture, which I think we have to talk about openly and honestly. And that is, in a sense, uh, the dilemma of African Americans. That the choice is the following two principles. By personal strength, I can learn the rules of success and become a successful American. Versus, no matter what I do, racism will trap me in my blackness. And it's a, it's a very key debate, which I think we're going to have to engage in the next five or six years. Because the question is, in America, is my success or my race the key factor? Am I more like an unemployed, uneducated brother or sister? Or more like other successful Americans, even if they are of Asian, Hispanic, or Native American background? Now, this is not my view. Uh, I, I agree with it. But in a sense, I was profoundly moved by Shelby Steele. You remember we showed last week Dr. Martin Luther King's great speech uh, in Washington at the Lincoln Memorial, where he said, I, you know, I have a dream of an America where my children will be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Well, Dr. Steele took the content of our character, a new vision of race in America. I, I would encourage every American who's really interested in the challenge of race in America to read this, because it's a very personal book. And he walks through, from his own personal experience, being in rooms, role playing, playing games, and how he feels about it. And also the challenge. Uh, he says the following. This is on page 164 of the paperback edition. He says, quote, I recently spoke with a black woman who described herself as a cultural nationalist. In her view, there were virtually no opportunities for blacks to enter the mainstream of American life, which she saw as fundamentally racist. She was, as we say, the blackest of the black. Yet this purified identity was achieved by an absolute denial of mainstream black opportunity. In her scheme, the more opportunity one admitted to, let alone took advantage of, the less black one was. The power of memory and inversion had virtually called this woman back to slavery and left her no option but collective action, since individual possibility was all but invisible to her. She was an extreme case, but also an extreme version of the paradigm that touches many blacks. Even among middle class blacks who function well in the mainstream, when the com time comes to declare one's identity, to announce one's blackness, there is invariably a denial of black opportunity. This is the denial that brings one securely back inside the circle of blackness that quite literally lets one feel black. To point to opportunity is to stand outside this circle to be less black. Now, this is a real crisis of our civilization because it goes to the heart of quotas, it goes to the heart of set-asides, but it also goes to the heart of a cultural debate about who we are. Are we 260 million people? And think about it this way. In American civilization, we, should, we would argue there are 260 million of us and that we're each individuals. But in the current elite alternative view, there's this sort of thing called America. But then there are a series of blocks. And the real test for you is which block are you in? If you think I exaggerate, look at government forms. Do they say, you're an American? They say, who are you? And what if you are Anglo-American whose mother was Dutch and Protestant, whose father was Greek Orthodox, and I would argue in the 19th century, they would not have thought of that as Anglo-American, but they would now, because Mediterranean people weren't considered the same as Northern Europeans. And you marry somebody whose mother was black and father was Chinese, but, who, but the father was Chinese Hispanic because his mother was Hispanic while his father was Chinese. 
which box are you in? And the correct answer is what? No. See, you don't think. No. Now think for a second. It'd be in the real world, in all honesty, if you were filling out a job or scholarship application, which of the boxes would you check? Other. 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 Black. 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 Probably black. Probably. It would depend. The correct question. Now listen, listen, listen. You're not thinking. Right. <laughs> right. The, the correct question is, at this school at this time, which group has the best shot of getting the scholarship? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I want you to think about it. That's why there was a scandal in San Francisco in the fire department, because everybody was inventing an American Indian great-grandmother. <laughs> Isn't that exactly what the system does? And furthermore, notice how it drives you apart. And yet, look at the threat. If, if you're in one of these, if you're in a favored group, favored because of some victimization, you know, if we suddenly say you're just an American, you lose all of your group rights and your group identity, and you get into a big cultural conflict, which, by the way, is not new. This has been going on since the 18th century, when the Germans arrived and lived in German communities. Um, go look at the Amish today. The history of America is the history of a tension between who you were and who you're becoming. And it's a very powerful question. And yet, the crisis of the inner city is really a clash between American civilization and a culture of poverty and violence. This is one of the things, this, and my, I really believe the inner city is not about racism. It's not a black problem or a Hispanic problem. And you're seeing it gradually spread. Uh, if you look at white births outside of marriage, they're now about where black births were in 1960. Black births in 1960 are actually closer to white births in 1960 than they are to black births now. Because what's happened is the first group to get hit were blacks because they were the most pushed into the welfare system. Blacks and American Indians. You, nobody has honestly looked at American Indian reservations. As, as centers of pathology brought on them by the government and the way the government Indian Bureau works and the standards and system. That, by the way, is breaking down for most ironic reason. They're opening up casinos because they have a legal loophole, so they're becoming centers of wealth. So they're rapidly becoming Americanized. It'll become a great, it'll become a great crisis among Native Americans the next generation. Because they'll begin to be rich enough to say, fine, I'm glad I'm a, I'm a Native American. Send me the check. I've got go, you know, to go to Brazil for a vacation. You'll change their whole world because they'll suddenly start being capitalists. 